Right, so I'm going to talk about a specific uh, contract archaeology uh, project that we have going on in Sweden right now. And it's been going on for over two years now, so it's quite a big excavation project. And um, yeah, it's the excavation of Neoladas. And I'm going to talk about how we have used and are using social medias and the internet as a whole, and also some conclusions about how it works and what we think, or my own conclusions, really. Yeah, I can't speak for everyone. Um, who am I? Um, my name is Clara, and I work for a museum in Western Sweden. And normally, or like normally, I'm a bioarchaeologist, but in this particular project, I'm the, like, coordinator for the communication program um, that happened because I was skateboarding and I fell and I couldn't walk for like six months so they were like okay you can go inside and like do the public things um, and that was two years ago and I'm still doing it so it's not too bad um, I'm just gonna shortly introduce the project to you um, about Nya Lördöse and this is actually yeah, it, it's only inhabited for 150 years, and we are digging in central Gothenburg today. So it like it was prior to Gothenburg, the second biggest city in Sweden, and they are reconstructing everything. So it's like a construction site. Uh, it's quite hard for visitors to come there, but we, we try our best. Uh, it's the largest urban ex um, archaeological excavation ever undertaken in that part of the country. And uh, it's a bit special because this is a collaboration between three different companies. So it's, I think right now there are about 30 people excavating. And it, the season is from like February to December. So it's like quite an intense project. And this is the third year we are doing it. And this is where it's situated in Sweden today. And that is what it looked like in the 1500s, so that was like the western outport of Sweden because the rest was like Norway and Denmark. So it was quite an important area. You didn't have to like pay taxes if you went there and like sold your stuff. Um, so it was quite big in the 1500s. Uh, I guess I don't have to tell you this. I thought it might be a bit more like mixed crowd, but you all seem to be like tweeting like crazy. So you get all this, uh, but this is just like <laughs> um, how we um, I don't know, like we have contract archaeology in Sweden, so we always have to like motivate, uh, motivate everything that we do in terms of why it's uh, important and why it's important to tell society about what we are doing. And um, part of this is, of course, increase public knowledge about archaeology to also, like we were talking about earlier, compete with self science. Um, opportunity to make cultural heritage accessible. Uh, it makes people feel that the cultural heritage belongs to them and that we do it for everyone's good and not just for a small academic society. I think it legitimizes archaeology because if it goes on behind closed doors, then what's the point to everyone else? Uh, dialogue and engagement. Uh, knowledge of the history adds value to the site. And uh, I guess that this is, yeah, nothing surprising, but it makes people appreciate the history more and actually the current place. And also in uh, the rest of the world, as far as I, I know, but especially in Sweden, they actually uh, changed the legislation about cultural heritage into being that um, we can actually request for the client that they need to finance the public outreach for the site too in actual bids. So the county administration boards in Sweden actually realize that this is like something that needs to happen and we need to make archaeology more relevant to society, um, which I think is very good. But what belongs on the internet then? Uh, there are tons of examples, I think, of uh, bad, good archaeology on the internet where academics will like publish things for the public, but it's not adjusted, it's not fitted to the public. It's fitted for someone who knows the language that we use and what we talk about and needed not a pre-knowledge to understand it. And um, of course there are forums for that, for academia and such things too, but the social media archaeology, I think, needs to go through a few steps. And uh, one is that, this is how I think, 
it should happen, that you investigate something and you document it, of course, and then you need to interpret what you find based on knowledge and experience, and then this interpretation needs to be adjusted to your, to your target group, and that interpretation is what needs to go on the internet for the general public. Uh, this was just an example of like, okay, so this is the raw material from the field, geese. This is a city plot, as you all can see. And then we did this, and uh, this is actually one city plot from Nielardase. And I guess most adults would understand what this is, the different rooms and how it's structured. But we also make school material, so this is a model that is ongoing work, but it's going to be an animation of the city plot. So that's just an example of how you can narrate something that people can actually relate to and understand. But also, of course, like texts, just like to write it, tell a story instead of like writing about what you find in what trend, in what direction, and how it was, what layer it was. Um, so our communication program uh, contains a lot of things. Uh, among those, yeah, um, it was an opportunity, since this project was a long one, although we've had to bid for it every year, but we know that it would be a large project and it's an extensive uh, excavation, so we had opportunity to engage in a long-term public outreach program. And it's quite forefront in Swedish archaeology and it's quite recognized. Um, and we wanted to develop a transparent and easy, easily accessible archaeology for society. And we got, just to give you an idea, 7% of the contract archaeology budget is actually within the public program, which we are very happy for. And the target groups, as specified by the county administration board when we were going to bid for it, was the general public, schools, local history, and archaeological associations, and the research community. And it's like the general public. That was like Okay, you need to like adjust your material to this. Um, so we, we had, yeah, when we started, we thought that, okay, how do we meet these, how do we do this? And of course, we've done lots of different materials for different target groups, but mainly what we wanted to do was to give the opportunity for people to actually know about this place and how it works and what happens here on a daily basis. Um, so that they can actually immerse themselves in the material and it's adjusted to a non-archaeological uh, scholared person. And uh, we also use the material to show clients how we're getting along and also the county administration board because not everyone is always... Yeah, not everyone wants to read a technical report or does it for that matter. Um, so this is pretty much how we have structured our communication um, we have a communication, yeah, I'm in charge of the communication, so like from the field we get information from the archaeologists and we, like everyone writes and helps us to, to get material out like on a daily, like every week, ask like, okay, so can someone write an article maybe for the web page and someone will be like, oh, I dug that well, I can write something. And then like, um, of course, information to the field about what's going on and information to the public. And between all those things is where the interpretation happens. And we try to, me and a team of others, try to, um, to give the archaeological story as it is, but like in an accessible way. Um, so to actually make this a bit professional, we, since we are three different companies, oh my god, I haven't looked in my favorites, um, we have quite a lot of different people engaged and contacts with um, people. So what we've, our communication team is communicator. Oh, well, that's me, I'm not a communicator, I'm an archaeologist. And that's actually like what we wanted to do in the first place. We were like, we want the archaeologists to be able to tell their story. Um, so it's more like someone in charge and reading the text and stuff. And then, of course, archaeologists as informants. Uh, we have a photographer tied to the project. He comes out once a week and takes some photos. Um, we have editorial stuff, and that's the same editorial stuff that like prints our technical reports, so they are already involved, but they do great graphic designs. Uh, we have uh, educators, and we have hired a web designer just to create our page, and the like daily changes that we make, we make ourselves, but we wanted it to 
look good in the first place. Uh, which we think is important because internet is a visual media and like everyone knows that when you go online and you go into a really dull web page that you have to like read really tiny, but you just leave. So um, we've tried to make that as good as we possibly could. And this is pretty much how we communicate online. A uh, web page is sort of our main hub and then all the social media are more like direct uh, outputs like daily. Flickr, Facebook, Twitter, we have newsletters and this YouTube. And um, this is pretty much what we do. We have a graphic profile uh, that we made in the beginning of the project. The editors made it. And it goes through clothing, digital material, business cards, signs, everything is just like the same layout. So that people actually recognize it. So like, oh, it's a new ladder project, it's an archaeological dig. Um, we do guided tours, school program, lectures, exhibition, um, information material, popular science magazines that also go online, web page, social media, email, and we have press contracts. And this is, I'm just going to show you a bit what it looks like, our layout. So this is a Neil Lattice logo that we use in almost everything. And uh, the sort of point with all of this is that it can be like its own trademark, this project and this city that existed. Because like everyone, in, I think everyone in Gothenburg now knows what Nialada says. Like no one knew there was a city there prior to the excavations. Or like a few knew, but they were interested. But now if you go like, oh, we're excavating the Nialada, everyone will be like, oh yeah, I read something about that. People know that it existed and I think that is a great step. Uh, so we wanted to promote the site and also since it's a collaboration, we didn't want like three different companies. We wanted to be, be like all about this excavation project and this particular town. And this is what it can look like, just like the graphic profile it goes through like everything. That's like, oh, meet up for guided tours thing is. We have like profile clothing and stuff and our magazines that all are popular. These are like quite popular because we do these and we give them out like three times a year and we distribute them at like libraries and stuff. And it's like really simple texts uh, that everyone can read and it's quite appreciated and we also produce them online. And yeah, it's just stories from the field. Like it's only archeologists writing these. And <coughs> just tells, and this uh, theme was like everyday life in Nia Ladasa, so. It's about like how people lived and what they did and yeah, clothing and crafts, things like that. And uh, this is actually a technical report, but just to show that like we try to keep the graphic similar as possible. Newsletters that we send out. Do we have actually quite many people who follow us uh, through that? And then to tell you a bit about our website, which is the more like I said, the online hub is the more static um, page that we have, where we publish some articles. We have like everything that's going on in the field, when you can visit us, school materials, such things where people can find us. And uh, yeah, that's just about articles. And there's like, I don't know, just like simple things. We had one of the super archaeologists writing about uh, her article is called about a dried cod and a pick in Norwegians and that is just like to just like some catchy phrase will just like make it easier and for people to get like a bit more into it and uh, we try to work with that and yeah and of course there's Facebook uh, where I guess we have most visitors but they are not as committed as the one that like comes back to our web page. Uh, this Twitter, we don't have loads of followers on Twitter, but um, since everyone sees everything on Twitter, I think we have more people seeing our things here than on Facebook, since only like six percent of the people who like the Facebook page will actually see it in their feed. So Twitter is a great forum. And this is our YouTube channel, and we just started with this this year and um, we just made some short clips one talking about uh, herbal medication our archaeobotanics we have about clogs we have about yeah different things and just have a short trailer and this is like really really basic 
Um, I did it with help from a photographer. Um, oh, okay, that didn't work. Maybe we don't have to, or does it? Yeah, it did. Or does it? No, okay, there's no picture. Oh yeah, there we go. Just to give you an idea. So that's pretty much how we communicate online. And um, just some basic statistics. Uh, this is from the web page for last month. And we had just over 5,000 visitors, which is, I guess, normal for us. Um, and the every second visitor is resident in Gothenburg which is quite good since it's our main target group is like the neighboring um yeah the city uh, it's an even distribution between female and male visitors and a third of the visitors are using mobile devices so we try to keep our web page as good for like um tablets and stuff as possible and this is something that we learned along the way but like about 50% of our visitors came through referral and that's we we don't have that many referring to us we have like the Gothenburg City Museum and we have the city of Gothenburg they sometimes promote our web page but that's still like 50% of our visitors um so that's important and i think we should work more with trying to get people to to tell people about us because apparently people have an interest in this when they just like happen to stumble upon us and then there's organic search uh, direct search or through social media is pretty much the same quantity. Uh, demography of visitors. I was going to show you for the web page, but when I was in Google Analytics making this presentation, I somehow deleted everything. Uh, so this is from Facebook, but it, it actually looks quite similar. Um, there are, of course, most people from Gothenburg, but actually there are like people from, I don't know how good you can tell. But yeah, there are some different languages. Swedish, of course, is the great one, and then there's English. And I guess that's like a bit of a... There are some difficulties because many Swedes would have like English set on their key keyboards, and then that would be like confusing. But there are from other countries too. Uh, Danish, Norwegian, of course, Finnish, because they can read Swedish. But then Italian, Polish. We have people from other parts of the world too. Um, but I guess the most important things for us here is to see... Um, which age groups we reach here. And of course, like most are between 24 to 54. That's like where you can see like loads of users. And we are actually quite pleased because we have loads of school activities like out in the schools and in the field. And the older people usually come to our like guided tours and they come to the library and such. So I think we reach them quite well. Uh, this is also where people come from who visit the web page and there are actually from different parts of the world. Someone in Mozambique went there. It's just one though. Uh, but you can see Sweden is pretty dark blue, so that's our main crowd. Yeah, I was just going to show you how we solved the language thing, because it is in Swedish, but we have this little Google Translate thing that was like a quick solution so that we could actually give people something if they visited and uh, was talking another language. And sometimes it works quite well, like this one. It's not too bad. I think this one was a bit funny because apparently we had like a teacher's display in New Ladas, uh, uh, <laughs> and it was a teacher show. Like that translation is just like out of the blue. So I hope that most people don't translate the site. 
uh, but that was like a quick fix because we didn't have a budget to like translate the whole web page. That's what we did. Okay, I'll just skip this because Tristan is looking at me, so uh, blah, blah. Uh, the, the point with this one was that like loads of um, our visitors comes through like things that we post on Facebook, so that's a good like way to get people to come to the web page. Blah, blah, this is just Facebook statistics. Um, last month, between like 500 and 3,000 reaches on posts. This is one of the more popular ones. It's a medi medicational little thingy, ceramics. Uh, almost 6,000 reaches, which we thought was a good one. And then there's this, our professional photographer, Marcus. He puts um, pictures on Flickr, like almost on a weekly basis during the intense season. And this is actually a great place. We don't have loads of, we don't really work with followers on Flickr. We link to it from our web page. We have visitors, but um, we mostly use it for the press. And it's very convenient because like, you'll just like look in the paper and you'll be like, oh, that's Marcus' picture. Because like they will just have gotten it and they have gotten a text from our web page and it's like, okay. So it's really convenient. Um, and it's used widely in like media in Sweden when they talk about this dig. And this is just what it can look like. Um, so we're trying to give like, people who are interested in archeology, span archeological research straight from the field. That's our aim. Um, yeah, what am I to say now? Yeah, so, um, I can read first, but no. Uh, the choice to actually do this, to take professional photographies and to write narratives which are transparent and which are like straight from the field, actually um, contributes to that when people spread information about this site, they use our information. Because I find like a lot of times that archaeologists will be like, no, I can't like give out my information because what if it comes out wrong and like I'm not done yet, like I don't have the results. But we actually say like, okay, look, we found this. It might be this, maybe it's not, but this is a theory right now. And then like maybe two weeks later, we'd be like, no, actually it turned out like this and it's from a vessel of this sort. And like we actually rescribe things all the time and we try to be like, give people some constant flow. And um, people tend to use the information that we provide because it is accessible and understandable. And actually, I tried to picture search Utskraldning i Gamlestad, which like excavations in this part of city. And like, I'd say like 80-90% are pictures that we took and that we distributed. Uh, which is really good, I think, because that means that that's what people actually use. <laughs> okay, uh, after the Nia Lalas project, uh, what we're going to do with this public art is, um, since we're focused on the project and not the companies, we can still keep the project in focus and as its own trademark. And we are going to, uh, the Gothenburg City Museum will take over the drift of the webpage and they are making a new exhibition, which Nia Lalas will be part of. So they will use our material as well as our school material. Uh, so we are very happy about that. And the company gain for us doing this is that we have something to show, like both to the public and to the county administration board and to clients and say, like, look, we can actually deal with communicating with the public and attract engagement and attention. Uh, benefits of social media. Uh, that followers is actually a commodity is, I think, quite important to actually build up your own uh, community and have that established and that is a good way to sort of both win bids and when you do it you just like keep on talking. I mean of course this is project specific but if we were doing it as a museum we would have probably a good blog, a good web page where we would just like had a stable community and that would just like could show that every time and be like look we have this, we have followers, people are interested and we can provide interested um, people the information that they want. Um, social outreach, as I said, is gaining importance in, in both legislation and like in the discussion about archaeology. Yeah, I already said that. Ah, uh, okay. Communicating archaeology, it shouldn't be about archaeology, but about communication. And that makes more or less the archaeological work a bit less visible, and what you see is the story that we want to tell about the results and about the past. Yeah, okay. 
blah blah okay um, I'm done okay thanks <laughs>